So anyway, it's just frustrating because like I'm going to see it and I'm going to enjoy it, but enough of it has been like ruined or spoiled or alluded to that um, I, I'm i sure I'll still like it, but it's been dampered for me. And like my whole point was like sometimes people just don't have the opportunity to go right away and I get that. And there are ways on social media to talk about things or start threads to have conversations that can that can like – kind of eliminate the spoiler so i think that most people i know have been pretty good with like game of thrones in this way where like uh, my friend kelsey does it great she'd be like i want to talk about game of thrones spoilers in my comments because i can get through your comments and not read them if it's the first thing on your wall yeah but those comments pop up they do you can say that but if you notice like the comment first because you don't know the person who's up here but you know the the commentor then you still get it spoiled usually if someone's post the spoiler like the first thing i see is spoilers i can scroll past fast enough not to like not to have it ruined for me um because i did that with game of thrones i didn't get to watch that till later just because i had miles so yeah um you know like with endgame i just you know like even with my wall like what pisses me off is like i'm just like it's but there are people i know who knew i wasn't gonna see the movie i'm like guys just like chill for a little bit like there's i have it's always amazing to me. It's like the geek people who know not to spoil it are the ones that ultimately fucking spoil it. Right. No, it always is. Yeah. And just so anyway, I'm hoping it will still be good and enjoyable. And I'm, there's enough. I There's enough that I don't know that I think I'll still have like some surprises. But for the most part, like I'm, I'm almost pretty confident I know what happens to Captain America. I'm pretty confident I know what happens to Iron Man. I'm pretty confident I know what happens to Thanos. <laughs> Um, um, so here's what I'll say, and I, I don't think this will give anything away because we haven't talked about it in a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, w- with the exception of like the actual plot of the film, I got all, everything else right. So yeah, and I'm sure it was like it, you kind of knew what was going to happen, especially if you knew contracts and everything like that. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like I, I mean, <clears throat> I know the kind con- because like that stuff. It sounds really silly. Like first of all, I find it interesting because of the field. Like I have an understanding of how it works, and I think it's. So I, I just, I find it interesting. It's more for me was like, how do these events transpire? And I'm sure there will be sure. some of them that like, I don't know. Like I knew one big thing cause everyone knew it and it's the time travel thing. Um, mm-hmm. cause that's like, the, see, that's the thing I got wrong. Oh really? Like, I mean, I'd heard leading up to it that it was going to involve time travel, yeah. but I, I like, I, uh, held on to the idea that they were going to instead do like the everybody's in the 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 stone idea that people had. Yeah. It's like, oh, there's a universe inside of a stone, and so we're going to do the Reed Richards thing. Not the Reed Richards. The it's, what's his kid? Reed R- R- Richards is one of them. It's Reed Richards' son. Yeah, but what's his uh, son's I name? I can't remember. The son world, Richards, Mini Richards. The world inside the ball. Yeah. And again, that's like I don't know the details of all of this stuff because I like that universe thing was something I just caught like a glimpse on someone's wall. So I'm hoping that there's enough stuff that I'm like, yeah, still. So for the record, I haven't said anything that spoils anything. No, no. I've said is bullshit. So don't worry. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, the time travel thing I know is true, but. Um, well, yeah. I mean, yeah, you said that shit. I yeah. Didn't... And I knew that just from set photos. So. Um, we should get started. Shouldn't yeah, we? we should. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Two Dumb Dads. I'm Chris. Uh, I'm Nick. <laughs> and I thought it was Tom for a second. I did too. You sound very similar. It is. Uh, we've gotten a lot of comments about that. And by that, I mean, that, that we haven't heard shit. I'm not even sure people knew you weren't here last week. Probably not. Probably I'm pretty not. forgettable. Grandma Jenny hasn't said anything, so I'm... Uh, Grandma I'm Jenny hasn't said anything in a long time. I know. I'm sad. Uh, anyway, this is episode 54. Jesus, 54. Uh, for May 10th, 2019. Um, today, on this sh- uh, today on the show, we're going to be talking about an interview with... I don't know why I'm looking on this device, because this isn't where Wait, I have the book. How many devices do you have? Did you read the book? Uh, Emily Oster, Emily Oster's uh, book Crib Sheet, which is a economical view of parenting, which is really cool. Um, so we're going to talk about that a little bit. It's a great interview, too. It really way, is. It's, actually, no, I kind of hated the interview. Did if you I'm really? being completely honest with you, I hated the interview. Have you read the full um, book, though? No, I'm about like a, a quarter of the way in. From someone who has not read the book, I liked the interview. Sure, so, sure. Just to put um, in context. We'll get there, though. Yeah. Uh, but first, as usual, we're going to start off with kind of a, uh, a conversation about your adventure in dadding. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask you to do the thing that I forgot to do last episode, and that was, will you give us a little uh, overview of uh, of your adventure? Yeah. So uh, my last adventure in dadding was basically I got mad at my kid and I yelled at him um, for mm-hmm. no fault of his own. I was just mad and annoyed. 
Um, and I grabbed him. I didn't like shake him. I just like grabbed his arm and was like, we got to take a shower. I like uh, that you're like actually shaking yeah. him in your models. Like, yeah, I, I, was I like, didn't shake him. We I don't want anybody to think I shook my no, kid. No. But, I, like, but we, I shook the shit out of okay. him in my head. We got to shake, take a shower. But like emotionally, I shook the oh, shit I did. out of that I kid. I really did. I was real mad. Um, fucking Hulk and, slam. And, 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 and then after he was upset, I had to like still give him the fucking shower. So like I just made it worse because Mm -hmm. now you're like angrily just trying to get him clean before you take him out and then i got him out and had to comfort him for like 40 minutes because i scared the (laughs) shit out of him the thing with the stuff yeah we went upstairs and rocked and then you know it's fine now um and -hmm. then i felt like massive amounts of guilt for it yeah uh, for like a week later oh wow like almost two weeks because i I didn't talk about it like um so that was my intro and i got really fucking pissed at my kid um by no fault of his own other than him just being a two-year-old yeah, I mean, that's rough. But well, what I really liked about the episode was your acknowledgement of having done it and like the very honest and truthful experience of like trying to deal with knowing you fucked up. Oh, yeah, because I knew I fucked up when it was happening. And like mm-hmm. it was that. So I always like I put it in perspective like my dad, because I think this is a good example of like my dad where. So my dad would do that and he'd wrong and he, he if he was wrong, he'd apologize, which would have been this sure. situation. Like my dad would have apologized for what just happened. But in that same token, I could not stop myself. It was like that runaway train where like you're trying to like, you know, you shouldn't do this, but you're just you're so frustrated. Um, and what makes it even more worse is I can I can 100 percent guarantee it is going to happen again. Um, and having to mm-hmm. like. Make sure it happens less frequently than more frequently, but also come to terms with the fact that like this thing is going to happen again. And hopefully, you know, when it does or if it does, you know, eventually you'll get to the point where you can talk to Miles about it and be like, I am sorry, I made a mistake. And you can use it as like a parents fuck up moment. Sure. Um, But it was it was rough because I scared my kid. And like I realized that like this had ramifications that were longer than. A moment it was the first time I felt like an action I had chosen to do was long. It had longer ramifications than like the 20 minutes that a kid normally feels something. And it right. was rough. And then I felt and like I said, I felt bad because it's something that I don't want to do as a parent. I think I said when I was doing the venture and dadding that I think yell, yelling, like the act of yelling will have a time and space. Like there's a time that something like that happens or yelling or sternly talking to, or uh, I feel like you get one or two, like one or two good yells, like legitimate yells, like sternly speaking is one thing. If you get through your parenting but, life with only one or two yells. I will be really impressed with you. My dad did. I, I, my dad yelled at me twice and I remember both of them. That's true. I guess that's your dad's. Per- I guess I could screw up my house where there was still a lot more of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, like you said in your, your adventure, your dad was a yeller and he yeah. apologized, but he was still a yeller. Yeah, and he still, and he still is to be clear. Like I know he's yelled at me recently. My dad's pretty much. He yelled at me the last time I saw him. I think his, that's he his, yelled at me while he was giving me a hug. I know. That's how he is. He is. That's his, that's his like. His mode. And you're right. Like I, there's a handful of times I think yelling it's, it's a nuclear bomb. Essentially it's, it's a rhetoric great article about it where it's like, it's such a primal thing that you can do and it is really effective. Um, but like it also has big consequences, right? Sure. Um, and you don't want your kid to have to turn out, sh- turn it, tune it out. Should it happen? Yeah. Um, so it, you know, it was really, it's really challenging. It still bugs me. Like it's still like to go back in it and realize that level of frustration that can exist. And I think that's a valuable thing. Like I, I really do. And like, this may sound terrible. I'm sure plenty of people will disagree with me, but I think um, like we, uh, parents always talk about guilt being a, a useful tool for parenting children. But I also think guilt is a useful tool for learning how to parent children. Um, like if you have a bad trait, that guilty feeling is what's going to, to get you away from it. Um, I always talk about this with like learning names. I, I, I don't remember names. Like yeah, I can meet you I. for a week every single day on that seventh day. I still won't know your name unless of course on that seventh day or whatever, they say, you still don't know my name. Do you? And you Come on, Chris, guilty. you're Bobby, aren't you? Am I, am I Jim's? Am I David? You don't know my name, you doofus. And then I will remember your name forever. I will go to my deathbed and say, his name was Johnny. Yeah. 
And that's a valuable like learning tool is to say like, okay, I, I feel like shit. Like I fucked up, I fucked up hard. And this is going to be something that I ruminate on for, for days, weeks, months. Yeah. And like, it sucks because it feels bad, but sometimes that's a good thing. Yeah. I, I also think like when, and as I've thought about this, like understanding and being okay with, and this sounds weird too, probably like that I'm going to fuck up again. Sure. Like that, that the act of parenting is you massively fucking up over and over again. And just can you fuck up either less so or differently than your parents fucked up? Right. I, I, so I agree, but, uh, but I also disagree in a way. Cause I, I, I would prefer to think of it as not massively fucking up constantly, but it's trying to, it's constantly making minor screw ups while trying to avoid the massive fuck up. Yeah. I guess it's like, okay, I am not going to smack my kid today. Yeah. Even though I really want to smack my kid today. Instead, I'm going to go sulk in the corner and make them feel like shit. Well, I guess like when I say massive fuck ups, I guess that that's all dependent on the person. So like for me, like a massive fuck up essentially is yelling at my kid when it's completely unwarranted. Like for me, that's massive. And I know myself well enough that it was going to happen again. Sure. Um, hopefully me drawing attention to it will make it happen. Yeah. Less. Right. Um, but for like my dad, right, that's not a massive fuck up for him. Like that wouldn't be my dad's massive fuck up for my dad. I don't think if he would mind me telling us like. It happened one time mm-hmm. where like he called me a name. He was so mad that he called me a name and he wasn't even mad at me. It was just life situations, right? sure. which I now understand as an adult. Um, and like, I just remember him in tears apologizing because he like called me stupid or something. Mm-hmm. And he just like, it broke him. Like it just yeah. broke him. Um, and that's how I felt yelling at my kid that for right. that, for that reason. And in that way. Right. Um, but yeah, you're maybe you're right. Like these minor mistakes that you make through the through your life and understanding they're going to happen again and and being acknowledging it and using that guilt to fix it, but also being kind to yourself to understand that like the next day Miles was fine. Like sure. he, you know, he's fine, he loves me. Like there's not like there's that forgiveness and understanding that like that's important too, that like you can Your rebound. kid's going to love you no matter what. Yeah. Like yeah. you can mess up, you can screw up. Um and, and, and he's still going to love you. He's going to forgive you and he's going to be okay. And there's always tomorrow. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So anyway, that was my, that was my venture in daddy. It was a pretty, yeah, it was a good one. Yeah. Um, all right. So I guess that's going to bring us to our conversation about, uh, the, the book crib sheet, um, or the interview of crib sheet author, Emily Oster. Yeah. And I really wish I had learned how to pronounce her name better. Um, That's like one of the first things we teach in communications classes, dude. Is learn how to pronounce names and and things and phrases. And I just said that I'm not good at names. Okay, fair enough. In that case, you're the one who should have been doing this because I don't teach kids to pronounce names. I just teach kids for the love of God, l- read something, like, <laughs> read some words, read a book. Goddamn it, do some research. That's hard too. I did do the research because damn it, I bought the book and you I did. I've read about a quarter of the book, which I, means. I, I'm just barely finally into the part where like the kids are kids and like whatever. I did not read the book. I just listened to the interview. It's good. It, we'll talk about it. Yeah. Um, I would think for someone like you, it would not be good because there are things that she was saying where I was like, oh, Chris is going to hate this. What are you talking about? That shit was right up my alley. Oh, man. But like going that, against like, like, everything she was saying was like, oh, no, this is Chris 101. Really? Like, like, like OK, there is research. There are good studies. There are bad studies. Sometimes you have to make sure you're figuring out which studies are the oh, good studies. But my favorite was like, she's like sleep training. I was like, it might be okay to let your kids cry. And I was like, okay, um, awesome. But you I am were, glad I were, know that now. You were so against that. Yeah, because we didn't look into how how good the studies were. Mm. Like, it's not like we were adamantly opposed to the research. We were just like the research that we had seen were the things that she mentioned about how we should get the like, okay, yeah. so let's address this. Okay. All right. So, um, Emily Oster has written a book called Crib Sheet, which is an amazing, uh, look at all of the parenting things. Um, and when I say all the parenting things, I mean, because this book, uh, specifically kind of goes off of after you break, uh, like from the moment the kid leaves the vagina, <laughs> Um, 
up until uh, I don't know if until exactly when because I'm only uh, 25% of the way through according to my Kindle. Um, but essentially through like the early chi- childhood years, like the, the basic things that you're going to be thinking about. That's stuff um, no one gets you ready for. She's written another book. I think it's called like uh, Hopeful Expecting or something like that. I, I Again, I don't remember exactly, but she wrote uh, uh, another book about pregnancy, which has the same perspective. That's cool. Um, and that perspective is effectively an economical view of of parenting. Mm-hmm. Um, so she's a she she and her husband are both uh, economists, and subsequently, the way she looks at the world is through an economist perspective. So there is the cost of something, like there's the data. So her goal was to look at all of the data and figure out like what's the good data, what's the bad it's data, what's analytics. the trustworthy data, etc. But then she also took into account like what does that data say? How reliable is it? And then what are the other uh, hidden costs? So, for example, uh, breastfeeding. I'm just going to throw out that breastfeeding. That was a really, really a, good one. That I've, one I've in, read in that shit in the book now, too, so it's good. Yeah. I haven't read uh, the marriage section yet. Which I do want to talk about that a little bit because I think that's interesting. Yeah, I, I, I list, listened to part of the – I think that's actually where uh, like my relist – my point is. Anyway, can you, um, the breastfeeding, which I thought was interesting because we formula fed – for half for a certain point. So the point is, is that um, there's the actual data about uh, whether or not breastfeeding is good for you. Um, it is. Uh, yeah. Just to be clear, it is. It appears. Um, now, what the the benefits are are different than probably what most people have said. But the point is, is that generally speaking, it is good. But then there's the other hidden cost of. Uh, the lack of sleep that the mother is going to get, the idea that um, it can be difficult and that the baby, uh, it might, it fucking hurts, apparently. I didn't know this. Did you know it hurts? I did because Sarah had a lot more issues breastfeeding than Aaron did. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, apparently it hurts. I mean, I, the, it's one of the reasons I, we, mean I guess it makes sense. Like there's something like um, um, uh, on your, your well, breast. Also, but. is a, um, I, I'm paraphrasing my wife, it's how they latch. So, like, if your mouth doesn't fit right with the nipple, it can latch incorrectly and that can hurt. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of like minor stuff. That's why some people don't do it or aren't successful doing it. So the point is though, is that all of these other costs of uh, uh, that, that play a role into uh, breastfeeding means maybe for you, like if you really value your breast, not constantly being gnawed on like eight times a day, if you really value not having to worry about like whether or not your milk is coming in well enough and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then maybe breastfeeding, even though it's of a benefit to you, maybe the economical view, maybe the value of it is not as high as it might, uh, might be otherwise. Something I thought was really interesting with this, because this is something that in, you know, in our situation where we breastfed for, I think six, six months, just to, to kind of close off what the point of the book is okay, before sorry, we start moving that. on to topics. Um, so in other words, what's happening in this book is that the, she's trying to, to give parents uh, a basic guide towards um, like, like what is the information? What is the information so that you can then take that economic view of whether or not those benefits are worth uh, the cost that that you might prescribe uh, otherwise, like that you might find in other places? Um, and so that's what the book is. It's a it, it's very much a data driven view of what the uh, what the studies say. And so it's exactly what it claims to be. It's a crib sheet. Um, so with that being said, Nick, uh, where are, like, where would you like to start with some of the information? So just to be clear, um, I've started reading the book. I've listened to the interview kind of half-heartedly. Like I would listen and then I would like, uh, I'd lose focus and then I would listen. And then how about this? How about we start just with a general overview of the interview? Like, how did we think the interview was? I, I, so I was doing, working on some stuff while the interview was going on. I really liked it, but I, again, based on how I get information, listening to an interview I retain information better than I do reading just because I'm not as good at reading, right? Sure. Um, but what I really liked about it is there were some things that she touched on, probably less in depth in the book, obviously, um, that as a parent, I thought a lot about like and felt bad about or had hesitations about or sure. or I felt vindicated in some ways, like, oh, I did make the right decision for this. Um, I thought it was a great interview, and I thought she did a really good job at touching on some major topics that I think parents – deal with like breastfeeding or sleep training or marriage um, that are really resonant. And I'm sure on the book, there's even more stuff. Um, Sure. 
But that, one of the things I really thought was interesting was was the breastfeeding comment. And I'm, are you, you said you had read that or you're in the... Yeah, I've read that section. So though. one of the other things she talked about, you know, she's like, yeah, there are benefits. But there's also this idea that a lot of the benefits tied to it is that they perform better in school. And I like that at least in the interview, she kind of debunked that and was like, there's a whole lot more going on with that study than like just... It's not a good study, right? That like Yeah, exactly. And I was like, okay, because I know a lot of people like that's one of the reasons they do it is because, well, like you want your kid to be smarter, sure. killing off kind of what we talked about a couple weeks ago. And that made me feel better because that was something that Sarah and I dealt with guilt. Like, oh, you can't do this. Well, now they're not going to be as nutritionally ready, which can affect their intelligence. And you don't want your kid's intelligence to be affected because you want them to succeed. And this big snowball that you do as a parent by one bad choice, right? And so in the book, she makes this amusing uh, uh, pointed statement of like, that that that's obviously bullshit. Like, that's one of those things that should be so obviously bullshit that it's ridiculous that so many of us think about. Because, for example, like, if you're talking about intelligence, then the first thing is like, if you're talking about 20 points on the IQ, then, then that should be so obvious where every person who's been breastfed is walking around going to Harvard and yeah. everybody else is like, like dwindling around in, in community college or whatever, right? But that's not what happens. It ends up being a, a fairly broad swath. And so if you're saying that this is true, then you're talking about like a point or two and what's a point or two a point or two is like like maybe you you filled out the wrong like like box or whatever on the test but what i thought was interesting with this interview or things she pointed out is even for me as a parent like how often you fall into some of these traps that because Uh you've heard it or like your innate parental parental sense is that well no this this has to be detrimental because you know, I feel it, right? Like I feel it as a parent, like, sure. I, like crying, You're like, Oh, my kid's crying. This absolutely has to be horrible. Like I just, and then she goes into the history of that too, like kids crying in orphanages and she was, you know, yeah, the, uh, the Romania, it was Romania, yeah, Romania right? Like, the Romania study where it's like the reason why there's been so much anxiety around, uh, sleep training and attachment, I think it was, uh, was that children in Romania who were in orphanages, orphanages to be exact when left for like days weeks whatever without human contact yes would have attachment issues yeah, like kiss, but some extreme Not issues for like overnight while you're trying to sleep with a quick hug in the morning yeah or like you know the 30 minutes you sleep when you're sleep training you, you leave them to cry like i thought that was interesting because you feel that though as a parent right it, at least sure. to me like the data sometimes goes against what you innately feel as a as a parent. And I thought that like hearing that and hearing her use like numbers and facts and information to support that, like sometimes your, your intuition as a parent might be wrong and and right. that's, that's okay. And you should trust that. Um, which I thought was really interesting to think about. The other thing is she said that was really funny in the interview, which. So can I read something real yeah, quick? Yeah, yeah, so I want to read something from the book that I think is important for, for kind of what you're talking about yeah. now. Um, I'm actually going to read three separate paragraphs effectively from three separate uh, whatevers, but it, it all comes in one basic statement. Um, she writes, this is a good time to reiterate what I said in the introduction. Like all other things in parenting, there is no perfect set of choices for everyone. There is a right set of choices for you, taking into account your preferences and your constraints. The fact that preferences matter, however, doesn't mean there's no room for facts. We cannot hope to make the right choices for ourselves without seeing the data. You and I may see the same data and make different decisions, but we should both come to the data as the first step. As an economist, I try to start my decisions with the data. What does it say? How confident are we in its findings? And then try to think about what works for my family in light of that data. Um, and so I really appreciated that because it really drives home what I think is a good, uh, a good perspective of what she's trying to say in this, uh, in this book, in this interview, and effectively what we're talking about with this data-driven sort of parenting is that um, I really like the idea that there's an answer to be made for you, um, that, like there's something that is best for you. But it's not necessarily explicitly what the data says. There's there's data here. There's data. It might be good. It might be bad. But knowing what that data is is an important first step. Um, I agree. And somebody, even in the interview, I don't know if you got to this point, like they were talking about screen time, right? And she kind of alluded to our ideas about screen time are off, like that you can be, uh-huh. in, that you can be in front of the screen for more than like, like if your kid watches TV for more than an hour, they're fine. Like that, that, right. you're, that you're like this demonization of screen time is not 
I'm not true's not right the word, but like we've over blown up. But then like the next question as her client's like, well, what about your kids? And she immediately like, well, they only watch X. You know, I mean, she does right. that thing that goes against kind of the day that she found because that's what works for her family. I was like, it was so interesting to me to listen to someone who like just read makes still a choice just using the data in mind. That like, sure. right, well, if you do use screen time to like go take a poop, which is my life right now, um, it, it's okay. Yeah. Um, or like I've been using screen time at night right now to like calm Miles down, but we're just watching something that he has, I want him to have interest in, but doesn't really have interest in yet. Sure. Just sports. Because <laughs> I want a sports buddy. He is starting to show interest in sports. He likes basketball. He comes on me and goes, go basketball. And he also says, go Cubs now, which is, Great. She wanted to get a uh, a baseball uh, a baseball and a bat, so we went out to to Target and got her a ball and bat this nice. weekend. Uh, I we still can't figure out whether she's going to throw right or left handed. If I set it down on the ground and have her pick it up and throw it, it's left handed. If you hand it to her into her right hand, she'll throw it right handed. Which hand does she use to do other stuff with? She's a little ambidextrous. Um, she tends to she she's mostly left handed. Like I'm okay. pretty confident she's going to be kind of like Aaron, where she's predominantly left handed. But she's also a bit ambidextrous where Aaron can do things with either hand. Yo, totally on top of it. You need to start like fostering that shit up. It's one of the things my dad did for me and it's, I'm so thankful for it. That you can use either hand for mm-hmm. things? Yep. The yeah. only thing I can't do really, I can't throw great with my left hand, but I can't throw great with my right hand. Um, <laughs> I wasn't going to say it. I was not going to yeah, say it. <laughs> um, but I have, I struggle to write with my left hand, but otherwise uh-huh. I can do most tasks Oh, cool. pretty Pretty well with both hands. My dad was like big on that. Okay. Because my parents forced, well, my aunt forced me to be right-handed. I was predominantly left-handed when I was little. Well, everybody kind of did that uh, during, like, I think our era was kind of the end of that. They started realizing that there's no actual, like, trauma in being left-handed. And I have older, an older generation, so they're still kind of like. Sure. That's totally random. But, um, yeah, that's awesome if she is. Run with that. Yeah. Run with that shit. The data shows that. (laughs) Um, So. What did you think? Did you listen to the part about marriage, marriage and kids? I I, I think that's yeah. I listened to, to some of it, not mm-hmm. all of it. I listened to, to a bit. Um, let me rephrase that. I remember a bit. Yeah. So here's here's my general feeling on this. Yeah. No shit. Yeah. Um. Like basically, what she said, from what I I could tell, was. So, yes, having kids puts a stress on your marriage. It means it's less good. It's going to be less good for quite a while. At the same time, if you had a good marriage, it's not going to be that much worse. It's going to be worse. It's not going to be that much worse. If you had a shitty marriage, then yes, it might destroy your marriage, but it was shitty to begin with. Yeah, I just thought it was interesting because, I mean, again, things that seem common sense, but were eye-opening for me to listen to someone say it. Like, my experience with kids from my family was that they have no effect on your marriage. They just make your family unit stronger and better. Sure. And to hear like someone say, no, 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 no. Like it fucks your marriage a little bit. Like maybe not to the point that it ends, but it decreases your happiness. Yeah. Which I thought some of the things she talked about having kids, which I, she summed it up great. And so did he was like, I'm going to paraphrase kids suck, but you still really love them. Yeah, I think that because this is, I think, right what I was listening to right before you walked in. Um, I I think what they basically said was like it is this unintuitive thing. Like like it, it, common sense says, adding this tiny crying creature that demands your attention and removes it from your partner, like it's obviously a bad idea for your marriage. And like the act of wanting to do this is just non-existent. Like nobody wants to be getting up eighteen times in the middle of the night to like put a body part into a mouth and have them chomp on it. Yeah. Shit isn't fun. And yet we are, are still driven to do it. And so it, it, I believe the, uh, the quote that I, I wrote down somewhere was that it is, it is joyful, but it's not fun. That's a, yeah, that was it. And I lo- that quote to me, especially right now, which I'm sure my adventure and daddy will talk about is so true in a lot of ways. Like I was talking to a student about this who has kids today that um, as a parent, like I, I really love being a parent and I love my son, but like even my last week adventure, like it's not always fun and it's super challenging, even the minutia of it and the minor things, but there's something so gratifying about having a child in a way that like how much, how fulfilling it is. It's this weird dichotomy. And I feel like th- when she, her talking about parenting, like that kind of sums up parenting in this weird way where like, this isn't fun. 
but I like it and I love them and I don't, I wouldn't change it. But like, where's the fun? Where's the fun, Chris? Sure. I mean, I had fun with them at the zoo, but I also got tired of being told to lay down 45 times on the grass, which was fun <laughs> for him. Sure. I mean, yes, we, we all do see. And that's the thing. Like sometimes I find that fun. I find it fun too. The first 20 times. Sure. You know, because I mean? like, cause they're kids and I don't know if he is in the stage or out of the stage, but like the repetitiveness of certain games is really fun. Oh no, she loves that shit. Yeah. Like, and it's also fun until like, you're like, I can't do this anymore. Or, oh my God, can we go just look at the fucking zebra? Right. Um, and that's what I guess I mean. Like it's fulfilling and it's joyful and there's a lot of joy in those moments, but like, it's also really difficult. And I guess cause they're crazy people. Um, was there anything else that you, upon the interview or reading that you really liked or stood out to you that you found interesting or enlightening about like a thought versus something that changed? So I, so my, my basic uh, interest in this, uh, in this story is, is more, I, I think this is a great book for people to use as a reference tool. Mm-hmm. Um, it is not written well. Much in the same way I feel about the interview, the interview is not interesting. See, it was, um, it was for me, but... I, I, it, I'd let me rephrase that. It's not entertaining. It's interesting. The information is very good. So if you're interested in the content, you'll enjoy the interview because it's like, okay, here's all my data. Let me take that, take my notepad and write it all down. Yeah. If on the other hand, you're listening to like a, a, a dynamic conversation between two human beings, you ain't going to get that. It was very much a, here's a question. Here's an answer. Here's a question. Here's an is answer. Is it weird that I really like that shit though? A little bit. Yeah, I really uh, do. I mean, you look, the different strokes, right? Yeah. But Because um, that's like, that is the Ezra Klein show. Like that is his like question, answer. And I, I like eat that shit up. Yeah, it feels very dry and very yeah. kind of uh, rote in, in some ways. Um, and the book is written very similarly to that. It's like, here are the studies. Here is the data. Here's what the data says conclusion and here is my abstract at the end so the the, the the top which is weird uh like all like the plot points of what this chapter says oh that's awesome um, i love that shit it is great like if you are a parent like it is the perfect crib sheet it is exactly what it claims to be like here is all the data you need to go make your decisions but as somebody in our situation or perhaps my situation it's like well most of these decisions we've already made them it's like i'm reading this now and i'm going I wonder if I feel like I made the right decision. And I'm kind of like, I don't know if I want to, like, I don't, I don't like, part of me is just like, let me feel like I made the right decision right now. Like, and this isn't her fault. This is me for reading it. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, she's done a great thing. I'm, I'm the asshole who's reading it. Um, let me come back to this if I choose to have another kid for my next round of decisions uh, to, to reexamine what the data says. Uh, but as somebody who's already made some of these decisions, uh, like I'm looking for a little more flavor text. I'm looking for more like, and so gosh, it sure would be funny if, or like, you know, little quips and asides and stuff like that, but yeah. that's not the book it is. It's very much a data driven book. And it's so funny to me because again, like you said, different strokes, different folks. Like even if I made the, the quote unquote wrong choice, cause I don't know a better verbiage to use. Sure. I like to understand what that was because I feel like even in. Some of these choices, like I can tweak or change something or it might give me information for later on when I make a choice. Um, like it made me feel like one thing I said, like the crying. And I know we slept training. We've talked about that before, but it makes me feel like a little bit less guilty when he is crying. And I make a choice to like ignore it essentially. So like sure. a good example would be um, he threw like a massive tantrum on Sunday. And I can't, I forget. Oh, he was hitting me. So he went to timeout. And then, you know, two minutes and then I took him out and they hit me again. So he went back in time. This happened like four times. So he probably spent like, you know, a good 15 minutes in time out, like in repeated, like, give me like, come out, come back in. Um, because that's how I'm not gonna hit me. Sure. So then, you know, but at that point, then he just got upset. Right. So like I took him out and then we didn't do time out and try to comfort him. He didn't want to be comforted. He just wanted to like be a blob. So finally I was just like all right, be a blob. I'm going to go do something else. Like I'll check on you. You okay. I love you. I'm going to go check on you. And it made me realize like, okay, I feel bad that he's crying, but he's not like his world is not going to end. He's not going to think he's not loved. And he's not going to think he's not like being taken care of. And it just reminded me of those things that sometimes I liked knowing that like I can go against my intuition a little bit. Sure. 
with some data backed up facts, even if it's correlating it in a different way. If I'm saying that correctly. Yeah, and I thought that was really beneficial. Um, one of the, one of the things that I really liked about uh the book, and I don't know if she said this in the interview, but one of the things that she relates in the book is she spends a, a decent amount of time basically explaining her methods, cause saying like, okay, so this is the hierarchy of research. Like we want randomized uh, controlled studies, then we want correlation on, then we want blah 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 blah. And one of the last things she says, and then there's one last kind of data that we all get, and uh, that is the observ uh, not the observational, but uh, I forget the exact terminology here, but basically it's it's like the uh, the 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 single experience. Okay. And so, like when we are looking online and we are looking through the forums, and somebody says, "Well, when I did this, I like this is what happened with me," or like, "Well, well, my cousin never did this, and for them it worked out just fine." And she very explicitly goes. I shouldn't say very explicitly. She very kindly uh, suggests what I'm not going to say so kindly is fuck them. Yeah. Fuck that data. That's not data. That's just a random observation. That's not a data point. Uh, and I really appreciate that because it kind of drives home the idea of like, look, there's actual data, there's studies, there are ways to experimentally examine uh, a randomized uh, in, uh, data points. And then there is, here is a single person that had a single thing happen to them. It's like, well, there are any number of reasons why this can be caused. That that doesn't help us. Yeah, I I really like that too because you stopped. And this is when I guess I've learned more as a parent. I'm sure you have too as kids develop personalities. Like your kid is just different than other kids. Like sure. so, just because sure. like your experience of doing this this way worked does not mean it's going to work for me because my kid's not your kid. Like. My kid has his own personality, his own set of like needs and desires and like what sets them off. Right. Um, and so like, I don't mind looking to personal experience if I'm like, Hey, how did you guys deal with this or handle this? Or like, what's your suggestion? Great. And then try to think like, okay, well like for you, cause I know your kid a little bit, right? Like, okay, well this is Thea's personality versus Miles' personality. So this probably won't work. Like I can't fucking reward Miles with any kind of candy. You know why? He doesn't give a fuck. And those aren't really the type of things that like studies are for, right? Those yeah. are all personality driven. I, I, I think in this book is in this interview, however you want to look at this, is very clearly more geared towards like a uh, human condition type of like physiological. W is this going to hurt or help your child? Mm. Um, and to that end, I feel like before we move on to the next segment. Uh, we teased this at the beginning. And for the record, this has been the least fucking structured conversation, right? Yeah. We bounce all the fuck over. So let's bounce back to where we started here. Something that I feel like we have talked about arguably since the beginning of this podcast. And it's time to put a bow on this. It's time for the final word. Nick, let's talk about sleep training. Yes. All right. So I am going to formally say hold that on, after... Hold, hold on, let me get situated. Let me just... Let that, me just uh, let me just get my butt. No, you go ahead. You get situated. Uh, let me just. Uh, you get all good and comfortable. I'm asshole. comfy. I'm comfy. Are you good? I'm good. Are you, do you need a cushion? No. Are you? Do you have a cushion? I don't, but I don't need Would one. Would you feel better if you had a cushion? No, I just want to bask in what's about to happen here. Are you sure it's going to happen? No, but I'm going to bask in it anyway. All right. Well, here's the deal. I actually haven't read this section, so I'm not going to read it like I was originally planning to. I'm just going to say. According to the interview and according to the data, which she said in the interview, sleep training is only beneficial. And more importantly, not sleep training does not cause any everlasting anxiety. Oh, God, There's no so actual good. benefit to not sleep training. Mm, let me just. Oh. So I am going to formally say we should have sleep trained. Yeah, oh, we know. Can you just say, Nick, you were right. Nick, you were right. Yes. Oh, God, it feels so good. It's like when my dad says he's wrong. It ha it's just, it's so hard to get out of you that it just, I just, oh, it's like a ray of sunshine around me. It's so beautiful. Now, here's what I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to put an asterisk on oh, you're, this. You're, gonna, you're going to, um, I'm going to put an asterisk. Okay. Uh, I will say that while I I have still come across to, to the decision that, yeah, we probably should have sleep trained. We should have sleep trained. Not probably, we should have sleep trained. That I do think that for Erin, especially for the first time, it was beneficial for her to feel like she had some sort of control over the possibility of developing anxiety and later on. So while it does not exist, while it has no actual benefit, 
I would say that that economic resource of her feeling as though she had some sort of control over something that was uncontrollable made that a a more reasonable decision than it might have for other people. Um, I think that was something Aaron especially needed early on because it was such a concern of hers um, that that having that uh, was something that probably eased the entire experience, even if it didn't help her sleep, even if it didn't uh, help her stress, uh, it it probably eased her anxiety over the possibility of future anxiety. And to be clear, I think that the fact that Aaron sounds bad in both cases, and I don't mean to sound bad towards you or bad towards my wife. Aaron just, I think, was up with her more than you probably were. Oh, yeah, because Aaron breastfed through yeah. the entire experience. And so, and because we stopped, like, I was up with Miles more. I still am. I just tend to wake up first. We also did it different. Like, the, the general scheduling, which, by the way, for the record, if you want to apologize to me now, mm-hmm. the uh, she actually suggests that the um, when it comes to, uh, to uh, like, breastfeeding and sleep schedules for the parents, that it's actually better to have some sort of a divided sleep schedule where one person takes one period of time and the other person takes the entire other period of time, so that both partners get a... Pro- a a lengthened uh, amount of sleep, an uninterrupted amount of sleep at some point. I think Sarah and I did that. I did. No, that's not what I remember. I remember very explicitly. No, that motherfucker has to get up with me. I don't give a shit if I got my booby out. Oh. He has to wake up with me because it is uh, like feminism. Go woman. Well, I also would always just wake up. But the plan was that I would do, and I did this. I did nine. She did mid. No, she did nine. I did midnight. She did two. I did six. That was the... Yeah, that's exact. So exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. She recommends shouldn't happen. Yeah. So instead it should be something like you... like Basically what we did was like from the time that whoever went to bed until about 3 or 4 a.m. is what I did. Yeah. And then from like 4... Like 2 or 3 or 4 a.m. to uh, whenever I woke up is, is what she did. Oh, yeah. Um, sure that's way better. And that way you get a solid five or six, like four or five hours of uninterrupted sleep. And if, quite frankly, if you're getting five hours of uninterrupted sleep, you're good. Oh, yeah. I mean, five hours is great. Because even now, like, I think it's like I tend to wait. When he does wake up, I just tend to wake up first. It's not a matter of like me. I just am the one that wakes up as opposed to like. Playing that game where you lay in bed and try to wait for the other person to wake up. Not that I've ever sure. done that. Oh, yeah. No, we've uh, all done that. Um, I just get up and just handle it. Normally. Not all the time. Because there's also times where, like, I don't wake up and I don't know what happened. Um, but no, I'm not telling you, right? This is my fucking moment. This is my moment. I'm going to bask in it. That's fair. You'd also get in trouble with your wife. My moment. So, as usual, we oh, don't man. have any emails this week. So... I get to come up with a question, and I'm so grateful because I feel like this is my opportunity. So you you have enjoyed this interview, right? This is the interview, uh, like the concept that you really like, right? Data-driven, here's a bunch of information. Screw those one-off observations. That one thing that happened that... that uh, uh, that not the metaphor, the the I don't know, the, the, the one story. Screw I, that. I like smart people telling me stuff, yeah. So here's my question. Would you rather go your entire parenting life having data, having the the answers laid out for you of what is beneficial, what is not beneficial, and being able to take that economic view of parenting for all future decisions, mm-hmm. or only have your mother's word? Can I ask a question, a clarifying question? Okay. Do I still get my mom's help when she's around? Uh, presumably. Like, she can still, like, like here, oh, you need somebody to hold this bottle? Oh, you need somebody to, like, I don't know, like, chase the kid in circles? Sure. I need someone to get him to go to sleep. Okay, but she has to maintain, go by whatever it is that you have learned from your data-driven whatever. Um. So, because I've seen my mom with babies... I'm a hundred percent going with my mom. Can I have my mom at my at more of my beck and call than she? Fuck is my... science. Yes, if it's for my mom. Fuck science. That yo, is the answer. Yo, my mom looks. This is how my mom works. After thirty minutes of recording oh, yeah. and talking about how much we value science, Nick still goes with fuck science. With Pauline Westermeyer, no other mom. 
Pauline Westmore because this is what she does. Because her one story, she will look her at her little... one experience. No, no, no. is clearly better than science. And all the grandbabies. Chris, I've watched this. Listen, she looks at a baby. She gets the baby. Hold on, she gets the baby and she's holding the baby, and she looks at that baby, and she goes, "Baby," and she like licks one finger and she like just slowly closes the baby's eyes, and the baby goes to sleep. And you're looking at that baby going, "How the fuck did you just put this screaming baby to sleep?" My mom looks at it and she goes, "Just a baby." just a baby and i kid you not it's amazing it's like fucking magic so you know what i think data matters except in the case of pauline motherfucking westermeyer the baby fucking whisperer i am claiming just familial luck i think this is purely there is genetics in your family maybe which it just means like the one thing that she does is what works for those genetics can i can i tell and that it is still not a data-driven solution. Let me give you one caveat, though. There was a baby who's not my mom's family. It's not blood-related uh, to us. Uh-huh. Um, who it didn't work. would not let anybody hold this baby, but... And she couldn't solve it. No, she did solve it. Damn. Mom was the only other person that could hold this baby. I don't believe it. I kid you not. Can't be true. This baby would scream and cry. The dad couldn't hold it. It was the mom and my mom. So much so that their mom became the godmother. Because only my mom could, like, quell this baby. My mom would look at that baby. She'd go... Hey, baby, how are you? Ah, ah, baby, baby. Licks finger, sleep. Baby falls asleep. There's a reason we call her the baby whisperer. This is not bullshit. She's magic. What's your recommendation? Uh, ooh, a nice segue. Um, my recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> what a beautiful segue. You just <laughs> abruptly fucking switch points. Yeah, and I was like, oh. My recommendation. Um, and that's going to do it for us. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah. Well, you go, because I think one. <laughs> I don't have one yet. You ass yeah. monkey. I'm trying to, listen, I've been. You know, okay, here's my recommendation. If you're trying to get your kid to fall asleep and get them to snuggle and relax, watch some sports balls because <laughs> they don't give a fuck. They're just like, all right, dad, I'll lay with you and watch it. Miles, do you want to go to bed? Yeah, daddy. So watch some sports balls. All right. We got time. So I want to do this recommendation. I think I've already given it, but I just really want to talk about what happened on Saturday. Uh, my recommendation is play dates. Fair. Yeah. I don't really give a shit. This is obvious, right? Yeah. Have a play date schedule. Time to be around other kids. It's not as obvious yeah, it's as you a think thing. it is. Everybody knows you're supposed to do a play date. There are TV shows, movies, whatever about play dates. Guys, it worked. My kid actually interacted with another kid that they didn't know previously. It was amazing. It was beautiful. The park was empty and Thea was shy and she was scared and she was all curled up. And then the other girl was like, hi, Thea. Hi, how are you? How would you do? And Thea was all curled up and scared and we just left him alone. We let him alone. They were up on top of the slides and we let him alone. And then like magic, they both went down the slide and they just fucking ran all over the place. Friends like, oh my God, birds. There's a bird over there. And then they chased the bird. Oh my God. It was like they were best friends for like three hours. I had that happen with Miles not planned at the park where it was an older kid that just started playing with him. And all of a sudden uh -huh. I got to like go sit down and like watch kind of like a hawk because it's an older kid. And I'm like, I don't completely trust you, older kid. But like, sure enough, Miles was like, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened. It was amazing. Yeah. It was the most I got to be like, wow. So this is what those parents do. This is why they come here. I was also really proud of myself. I you did not it? embarrass myself to the degree that my child was no longer allowed to play with their child. That is perpetually my fear at the park. Like, I'm aware Thea is eventually going to grow out of her shyness. Even if not completely, then to some degree, she'll be like able to play with or around other kids. Mm -hmm. My fear is that my awkwardness is going to embarrass myself enough that other parents aren't going to want to be around me and subsequently won't allow my daughter to be around their kid. Oh no, if their kid likes your kid enough, they'll totally, totally let you be around. I don't believe that. I feel like there has to be adults who you're like, ah, this person is so insufferable. I'm going to find another kid. There's another. There's enough kids in this city that uh, that, that you can find another kid that with an adult, like especially at this age, where, like they don't really have personalities. It's just kind of like, oh, you you like blue. You like colors. I like colors in general as a philosophy. You only need one parent to be chill though. So just give them to like your wife or vice versa. Oh yeah, no, everybody likes my wife. See, that's our game plan. Like, I get us in the door, and Sarah keeps us in the door. That's always been my strategy. Yeah. I send them the announcement. I bring my wife, and she's like, well, actually, I'm a nice human being. He's a doofus. I just realized my wife's 
cool. I don't know how to describe it. Like my wife's the cool one. And because of that, like it's like the high school dynamic where like you're dating the cool person. Like she's the cool one. I'm just the talkative one. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, we, we, neither of us have that. We are both the doofuses. Um, but like the thing is, my wife is the doofus that people likes because she's really nice and sweet. I'm the doofus that people are like, oh, you're such a doofus. I'm like, yeah, I am a doofus. I, I'm, I'm a little doofy. That actually makes your wife the cool one. That's good. Yeah. It's kind of fun. I've never been around cool people. Like, I'm the cool one. Well, that shit's always been true. Chris, where can we find you? You can find me at Chris Moss again on Twitter and at Rampant55 on Twitch. And you can find me at N. Westemeyer on Twitter and at N. Westemeyer on the gram. You can find us at our website, twodumbdads.com. And hey, if you have an email, you can reach us at emails at the number two dumbdads.com. Sometimes we do get emails. Every now and then. They're kind of nice. They're fun. I enjoy them. You can also send us Facebook messages. Oh, is that a thing? That is a thing. I think you've gotten one of those before. There has been one once before. Okay. Okay. <sighs> I feel like there's other stuff we're supposed to be talking about here, but you know, we're we're at the end. We're at the end. Listen, my brain's fried. I've been like a single dad for 11 days. Yeah, we're going to have to talk about that one soon. Oh, it's going to be an adventure in dadding. Will it? Oh, yeah, it'll be right about that what, time. Why, why well, we have a month before your next adventure in dadding. No, you have one next week and I yeah. have one. No, no, not next week. Yeah, that next week. Yeah, but we think have three about, weeks. I'll only be able to talk about my adventure in dadding. and then an episode, and then, and then an adventure. That's three weeks. True, but think about this. Three. I'll be able to talk about the adventure in dadding, and then uh-huh. also... Are you just going to like shoehorn this into the episode? Like, yeah. so your adventure was that you took a poop alone? Yeah. Well, let me tell you about how wonderful pooping alone is exactly. when you're all alone with your kid. But a tease for my adventure today is you also know what it's like to have your spouse gone for a, a decent amount of time. 12 days. And then <laughs> 12 days is a lot when you have a two-year-old. I'm, I, I, I was just being more specific. Yeah. For, I'm not denying it's your actually your It's statement. actually 11 and a half because she was able to come home one night. Um, But then what it's like to reintroduce that parent in back back into the dynamic when you've had to only parent by yourself for 12 days I think it's going to be interesting it will be interesting we'll see who kills him first until next time she'll destroy me be well be well